Hey, book lovers. Want to hear a story? Welcome back to Storytime with M. This is a bonus episode from M's Books and Cats podcast, where I am sharing my book Super Gym with you, a chapter or sometimes two a week, and we are getting very close to the end of this one. Now, as always, Super Gym does contain mature content, and it might be triggering to some people, so listen with caution. Otherwise, please enjoy Chapter 25 of Super Gym. Maggie had been running for hours, maybe even days. There was no way to tell. She couldn't remember beginning. It was as if she had always been here, always been running. The display on the treadmill had no numbers. A bright yellow smiley face glowed up at her instead. Her body was numb. Every muscle had been worked until it cramped, released, and cramped again. But she kept moving. The speed changed at irregular intervals. At first, the belt went faster and faster. Maggie was certain she was going to die. Her heart was beating too fast. Her chest was tight, and she couldn't breathe. She couldn't hold the pace. Her foot slipped, and she narrowly missed crashing down and being thrown from the machine. Her legs wobbled. She grabbed the handrail and got her feet back under her. It took a while, but slowly, her rhythm came back. The smiley face flashed twice. The treadmill slowed. Maggie still had to jog, but her breathing was easier. She could spare a moment to look around. There was a woman on the treadmill to her right. Her ribs were visible through the loose gray skin that sagged from her bones. Her eyes were vacant. She stared dully into the space in front of her machine as her feet pounded out a slow and steady rhythm. She was only technically still alive. The man on her left was dying. She turned just in time to see him drop. His lifeless bag of bones was thrown off the machine. He hit the wall and crumpled against it. One leg lay against the still-moving belt, and the skin was quickly torn away. Blood sprayed the wall and pooled under the machine. Maggie stumbled again and turned her focus to her own struggle. The pain was returning. It came in waves. One moment her body was numb, then pain exploded in her joints, and every step was agony. There was movement to her left. Two burly counselors scooped up the man's mangled body and carried it away. They left his treadmill running. No one came to clean up the blood. The spinning belt covered everything with a fine mist of crimson. The smiley face on Maggie's machine flashed three times. The belt began to whir. Maggie grabbed the sides and forced her feet to move faster. This was it. She would be forgotten. She would fade away and die. No one would miss her. Maggie was broken. Her situation was hopeless. Before fat camp, she had always held on to a shred of hope. She believed there was a way around the madness. But she was wrong. No one escaped. They were all doomed to the same fate. Time went faster on this side of the wall. The end was closer. The hours passed. Two, four, ten. Time didn't matter. There was only the end. The rest was just waiting. The smiley face flashed six times. The treadmills slowed to a stop, and the noisy warehouse fell silent. Maggie's calves cramped, and she gripped the handrails as her legs tried to crumple beneath her. Everyone was lining up. Maggie shuffled painfully into her place. The long, gray rows of campers plodded through the wide metal door in the back of the room. She glanced over her shoulder as they passed through the doorway. The line stretched into the far end of the warehouse. Every camper was stooped, brittle, and gray. The March of the Dead. Outside the world was a bland landscape of taupe and tan. The black burnt sand was slippery and made the walk to the cabins excruciating. Her feet were cramped, painful clubs in her tattered sneakers. Her legs were shaky and heavy as lead. It wasn't far, less than a mile, but it felt like a hundred. Every step was one closer to the end, and she welcomed it. Maggie's line stopped in front of a rickety wooden building. There were holes between the ragged driftwood planks that made up the walls. A tattered brown curtain hung in the doorway. Spray-painted on the curtain was the symbol of a pig. A counselor appeared at Maggie's side. He was enormous. His skin was stretched tight across his muscles, and she could see every vein. He was too muscular. Not quite the ideal. That's why he was at fat camp instead of the super gyms. 
It would be hard to hide this monster anywhere else. He pointed at her with a beefy finger and growled. You, this is your cabin. Pig cabin 12. You sleep here. Share a bunk with camper R2267. He gave her a hard shove and she fell to her knees near the doorway. The rest of the line shuffled on through the burning black sand. Four women remained. They regarded her sullenly. Maggie shaded her eyes from the dazzling orange light of the setting sun. She examined her bunkmates. They were more muscular than the waifs that had occupied the treadmills around her. They had the same sagging gray skin, but that was the only similarity. These women were round and hulking. They were fatties like Maggie, but there was muscle under the fat. Mr. Pratt hated this type of woman. Strong but not thin. A woman that would put up a fight and not just bow to his will like everyone else. One woman stepped forward and offered her hand to Maggie. She was beautiful. Her muscles popped under her dark, flawless skin. Her hair was wound around her head in an intricate braid, and a long, white scar decorated her throat. She tried to smile, but it was more of a grimace. She was missing several teeth. Eeyore Maggie. Maggie stared at her. The short blonde woman near the cabin's entrance laughed. Yeah, we know who you are. Everyone does. The beautiful woman pulled Maggie to her feet with one strong, swift motion. I'm Lindy. That's Maureen, Kate, and Tanya. Welcome to Pig Cabin 12. Sorry you have to join us. Maureen and Kate slipped inside without acknowledging her. Tanya, the stocky blonde, sighed and cracked her knuckles. Don't mind them, they've been here too long. Their spirits are broken. What about you? Tanya considered Maggie's question. Not yet. Close, though. She stretched her arms overhead. They were tattooed from shoulder to wrist. Black and red dragons danced through a waterfall of flowers. She ran her thick fingers through her hair. It stuck up in random places. Her eyes were tired and ringed with dark patches of skin. Tanya lowered her arms and heaved another large sigh. This place will get to even the strongest of us. Eventually. Lindy nodded grimly. She gestured with her long-toned arm to the desolate brown hills and broiling sand. This is it. This is how we die. It's hard to accept, and acceptance is death. She suddenly looked very tired. Her face was haggard and not nearly as beautiful as she had first seemed. Maggie looked around. Rows of derelict cabins stretched as far as she could see in every direction. How big is this place? Tanya tipped her head to the side and her neck popped loudly. She shrugged. Big? There can't be many people left in Famicili. Most of them are here. Lindy shook her head. It's not just Famicili. There are some from other cities. Maybe other countries. Who knows? It doesn't matter. There is no hope. This place is the end. Tanya was staring at her. Her muted blue eyes were wide. She put a hand on Maggie's shoulder and squeezed. Maggie winced. Everything hurt. Tanya wrapped her arm around Maggie. Now that you're here, we have hope. We know about you. You're the unbreakable one. Maggie's face was hot. She couldn't meet Tanya's intense gaze. I'm not... I'm... I'm as breakable as anyone else. Her voice was a whisper. Tanya looked away. Oh, she said quietly. That's too bad. Her whole body seemed to sag. Her eyes were hopeless, and her arm dropped away from Maggie's waist. She pushed the blanket aside and entered the bunk without another word. Lindy watched her go. Don't mind her. We lost a bunkmate this morning, and they were close. It broke Tanya's spirit. She's given up, even if she doesn't realize it yet. I'm sorry she's disappointed, but I'm not unbreakable. Look at me. I'm broken. I've lost. You said it yourself. This is the end. Lindy gave her a sidelong glance. There is always hope. Many of us would fight. We just need a leader. That's not me. Too bad. Lindy was angry. Her hands balled into fists at her sides. Her jaw was set in rigid defiance. 
Maggie understood how she felt, but there was nothing she could do. She couldn't lead a revolution. She couldn't sacrifice herself for them. She wanted to survive. Lindy disappeared inside the cabin. Maggie stood uncertainly by the doorway. Her hands strayed to her throat. There was a slight buzzing sound. Her fingertips tingled, and she lowered her hand. A dark, hulking mass was approaching. The behemoth counselor had returned. He was barreling down the path between the cabins. His face was a purple mask of rage. He was screaming as he ran. You, T-4200, get in your cabin, now. She quickly ducked inside and he sprinted by without slowing. The ground vibrated as his feet pounded the earth. The rickety bunk beds shook with each footfall. She peeked through a hole in the curtain. He shot a look over his shoulder and pointed at her without breaking his stride. Maggie stepped away from the doorway. The other women were watching her with unfriendly eyes. The bunk above Kate was open. There was a thin, stained blanket covering the lumpy mattress. Maggie avoided their sullen stares as she crossed the warped floor and climbed painfully up onto her bed. It smelled like rot and stale urine. Maggie gagged. Lindy smiled. Maggie thought she saw a quick flicker of compassion cross her face. You get used to the smell. The stench was overwhelming. Maggie's stomach heaved. She leaned over the edge of the bunk and vomited. Hey, Kate cried out and rolled up close to the wall. Go outside and do that. Maggie climbed down shakily and looked around for a way to clean up the mess. Lindy sighed and shook her head. Just leave it. They hose down the bunks every morning. Get back in bed before you get us all in trouble. Maureen propped herself up on her elbow. Her arms were thin but muscular. Her translucent skin sagged on her bones. Her hair was graying but had once been a deep chestnut brown. Her haggard face lit up, and she let out a hoarse laugh. Hey, Lindy, she rasped. Bring back memories? Lindy shuddered. Her face darkened. She rolled over in her bed and turned her back to them. Maureen looked at Maggie with her tiny bloodshot eyes. Lindy was on the BMP plan, she said in a loud whisper. She looked to see if Lindy would respond, but the woman stayed facing the wall with her arms wrapped tightly around her body. She held herself perfectly still. Maggie saw the telltale marks on Lindy's fingers. The BMP plan was a common diet plan for problem clients. It was the ultimate plateau buster. Trainers used it on clients who showed little or no progress for a week. It was guaranteed to work at least for a little while. Maggie had always wanted to be assigned to that plan. Clients on the BMP plan were allowed to eat real food. It was one of the only plans Maggie had not tried. Tessa had always enjoyed creating her own solutions. Maureen coughed. It was a dry, painful sound that went on for a long time. When it subsided, she spat into a soiled gray rag and croaked out a laugh. It worked, didn't it, Lindy? Lindy didn't respond. Her body remained motionless. Maureen gave another rusty laugh. For a while, anyway. She leaned across the small space between their beds. The bed shifted. It almost tipped. Tanya glared up at them but didn't say anything. It almost killed her. They minimized the binge portion of her program. There was nothing left to purge, but they made her keep trying. Boom. Throat split right open. There was blood everywhere. Maggie glanced over at Lindy. She still hadn't moved. Her body rose and fell slightly with her breath. Maggie wished Maureen would shut up. They saved her for some reason. She was interrupted by another coughing fit. She waved a hand at Maggie. They don't usually bother. They just let you die. I think it's because she's a problem client. All of us pigs are. They can't stand us. Problem clients are failures, and trainers cannot fail. She spit into the rag again. It was speckled with red. Maureen was staring at her. She squinted her tiny black eyes, and they vanished in a pile of wrinkles. I know who you had for a trainer, that bitch Tessa. You were her only client. A special case. Everyone knows about you. You don't know anything about me. Maggie instantly regretted her words. Maureen recoiled and flung herself back onto her bed. She huffed indignantly. She crossed her arms over her chest and closed her eyes. No one would look at her. They rolled toward the walls and feigned sleep. 
Maggie lay back on the smelly mattress and stared up at the patchwork of metal overhead. She could see the sky through the holes in the roof. Stars. She could see stars. There was no heavy gray smog. No bright neon. Maggie couldn't remember the last time she had seen stars. It must have been when she was very young. The endless black sky made her feel even more alone. The room was too small. The walls were closing in around her. Her heart rate increased rapidly. Her chest grew tight. The collar crackled and buzzed. It singed her skin. Small whimpering sounds escaped involuntarily and betrayed her. The others heard, but no one moved to comfort her. She didn't expect them to. Maggie clawed at the ring around her neck. Sparks exploded under her touch. She wrapped her fingers around it. Her flesh sizzled and smoked. The cabin filled with the smell of cooking meat. The metal tightened around her neck. It was choking her. Kate's eyes peered over the bunk. They were black and watery. She sniffed. What you cooking? She lifted her nose into the air like a dog and sniffed again. I smell meat. Her thin, gray fingers gripped the mattress. Maggie couldn't respond. She gasped and writhed, but no air entered her lungs. Kate disappeared for a moment. Maggie could hear her rustling around on the bunk below. Maureen rolled over and watched Maggie blankly. Kate appeared between them. She raised her hand above the bed. Grasped in her bony fingers was a long, thin sliver of metal. It looked deadly in the silver shaft of moonlight that penetrated the cabin's roof. Kate grinned. Her teeth were broken and sharp. It smells so good, she whined, and I'm so hungry. Maggie's eyes never left the blade. Kate raised it high over her. Maggie shook her head violently. Her lungs ached and the ring burned deeper into her throat. She struggled and tried to cry out, but no noise came. She dropped her hands to her sides. She had no fight left. It was too hard and she was too tired. This was the end. She gave up. Lindy slammed into Kate and knocked her to the floor. She popped up and grabbed the ring. She gritted her teeth and pulled. Sweat beaded on her brow. Her muscles popped and she growled with the effort. There was a metallic clang and the ring snapped. A shower of blue and green sparks erupted from the broken metal. Colored wires smoldered within the ring. The cabin filled with an acrid blue smoke. Lindy dropped the pieces onto the mattress. It sizzled, and the ring melted into the moldy fabric. Maggie was free. She sat up and rubbed her throat. Kate was still lying on the floor. Tears streamed quietly down her face. Tanya and Maureen stared at her from their bunks. Lindy ran her hand over her face. It hesitated briefly on her scar. Kate? Lindy's voice was cautious. Kate didn't answer. The tears were flowing faster. She made small hiccuping noises in the back of her throat. And then she laughed. Her laugh was high, thin, and mad. She struck like lightning. Her hand darted out and grabbed the thin metal spike. She was still laughing as she drew it across her throat. The skin opened, blood poured out of her. Her last laugh gurgled and she fell silent. Her eyes looked at something Maggie and the others could not see, and a small smile settled on her lips. Lindy poked her gently with a toe and cursed quietly under her breath. She went back to her bunk and rolled toward the wall. Maureen and Tanya turned away. Don't look at her. She's free now. Other Maggie. Welcome back. It was nice to hear her voice again. Maggie laid down and put her hands behind her head. She felt the corners of her mouth twitch slightly. She didn't feel quite so alone with other Maggie around. You've got to get out of here. No kidding. Get some sleep. We'll make plans tomorrow. The charred hole in the mattress was still smoking. Through it, she could see the bunk below. The mattress was stained with blood. Maggie rolled over toward the wall. Her powers had returned. She could feel it. Her body was pulsing with new energy. She had always avoided using her powers as much as she could. The power to take a life was not a responsibility she wanted. Sometimes she didn't have any control, and mistakes had been made. 
Maggie wanted her powers now. Her hands strayed to her throat. The skin was tender and sent a fresh wave of pain through her when she touched it. Her hands balled into fists at her sides. She wanted to kill them all. Maureen and Tanya and the burly counselor. Not Lindy. No. Lindy had friend potential. She had saved Maggie. Helped her. Freed her. Maggie wasn't sure if she should thank her or despise her. You're alive. You have another chance. Be satisfied with that. Be patient. Play along. Maggie pounded her fists on the dusty mattress in frustration. She didn't want to play along. She wanted to do harm. A lot of it. The burly counselor would be first. She was afraid of him. It pained her to admit it. Men did not scare Maggie. She knew how to get what she wanted. And she knew how to survive. But this monster was different. The men she had previously dealt with had been at least a little bit sane. This man was not even close. His eyes were black pits. He didn't see her, yet somehow he could sense her presence. And he was always nearby. She could see him through a hole in the wall. He stood in the middle of the black path. He faced the cabin with his hands on his hips. The moon cast a shadow over his face, and his eyes were dark, empty hollows. Maggie would need to deal with him soon if she was going to survive. And she wanted to survive. The realization surprised her. Even in a place as hopeless as Fat Camp, there had to be a way out. There had to be some weakness that would open everyone's eyes to the reality of what was going on around them. Something to spark a revolt. If not that, an escape route would do. Survival was the priority. If she could only save herself, that's what she would do. There was no point in sacrificing her life for someone else. She would survive and help anyone she could, while keeping herself safe, of course. So far, she had not found anyone worth saving. Lindy, maybe, if she could be trusted. Maggie could breathe again. The tight ball of tension behind her sternum loosened. With each breath, she could breathe a little deeper. She could feel the oxygen returning to her body. Her fingers tingled. The walls rattled. The air became charged, and small white sparks danced around her. Thunder boomed in the distance. The sparks from the air filled Maggie's body with light. Her skin hummed with electricity. The feeling was not quite the same, but Maggie knew what was happening. She held herself still and stared up at the sky. Dark, sinister clouds rolled in and blotted out the stars. The silence was broken by a high, terrified wail. There was a thunderous crash. The walls of the cabin shook. A growing murmur of confused voices filled the night. A tall, lanky counselor ran into the cabin and planted her hands on her hips. Everyone was awake and sitting up in their beds. She surveyed them all with sharp, beady eyes. Everyone out. Now. Line up. They stumbled out of the cabin and into the cold night air. They were jostled into line by rough hands. The counselors ran up and down the rows, barking orders and whipping anyone who didn't comply quickly enough. Maggie felt the burn of the whip on her ankle when she failed to lay face down on the ground. She barely noticed the sting. Her eyes were transfixed on a cabin not far from her own. What was left of it? Amongst the wreckage lay the bloody remains of the brutal behemoth counselor. She dropped down into the mud with a smile on her face. She met Lindy's eye and grinned but Lindy just looked away. And that is the end of chapter 25, book lovers. I hope you're still enjoying Super Gym. I will be back next week with another episode. Until then, keep reading.